down the road. So I'll start with a quote, let food be thy medicine. This is um, from Hippocrates. Uh, you, you thought he only said first do no harm, but he also knew about diet and IBD, apparently. Uh, and this is what I hope my food pyramid <laughs> can look like. This is my medicine. <laughs> uh, I had carne asada on Friday night and definitely was made me feel good. <laughs> um, so for today, we're going to just do an overview on inflammatory bowel diseases. Obviously, you know about that, but it'll give us a little context. Um, we'll talk about the connection between diet and IBD and dive into a few specific diets that have some evidence uh, for working and talk about future directions. So um, to start, as you know, inflammatory bowel diseases are, are the most common phenotypes are Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but that they're mostly probably a spectrum of diseases in which the immune system is overactive, not due to a stimulus that we would expect it to be active to. So the GI tract is lined with immune system cells. Why? Because when we put things into our mouth from the outside world, we can introduce things that are typically good, like food, or we can introduce things that are, are bad, like some pathogenic virus or bacteria. And so the GI tract is, even though it's on the inside, it's actually on the outside of our bodies. It's exposed to our environment. And so our immune system is on the ready to interact with what we put into it and, and hopefully protect us. But in inflammatory bowel diseases, the immune system overreacts to something. Um, and I think, you know, we'll talk a little bit about, about that. Um, we think, we know that IBD happens um, north of the equator. Uh, 1.6 million Americans are affected by inflammatory bowel diseases and um, about 25% are diagnosed in pediatric age. Um, so what causes IBD? We've been hearing a lot about it this morning. The genetic susceptibility, you know, maybe explains a quarter or a third of the heritability of IBD, but also um, what is in our GI tract, so what uh, are the microbiome that lives there probably triggers the inflammation. So we have 100 trillion cells in our GI tract that are not native to us. They are um, living there uh, as bacteria, viruses, fungi, and those cells, because they live in our GI tract, usually aren't doing very much to hurt us, but we think they, they probably trigger the immune system um, to be active in infla inflamed bowel. Um, so there's some combination between genetic susceptibility, the microbiome, the way the body responds to it, and then the environmental triggers that might play a role in how all those work. And so diet uh, is probably the most important, in my mind, trigger. Um, but, you know, infections, NSAIDs, smoking, stress, antibiotics, all those things change uh, what's inside our GI tract to maybe be more predisposed to inflammation. Um, Michael Pollan, he's my, one of my, uh, I love his, his books. Um, so I thought for when we're not in an IVD flare, um, we can all live by eat food, not too much, mostly plants. So what, again, is the connection between diet and IBD? We'll, we'll dive in a little bit more. So this slide is a little bit busy, but I think it really helps to highlight or emphasize what's going on in the GI tract in a healthy gut versus in a GI tract with inflammation. And I think the focus with diet and IBD has really been on Crohn's disease in terms of treatments that might lead to mucosal healing or lead to healing. Um, and so on the right is they're saying Crohn's disease, but certainly inflammation and ulcerative colitis works in a similar way. So on the left-hand side, the, um, so these rectangles that are kind of like the color of diarrhea, they are um, the, cells, the, the cells that line the GI tract. The yellow bar that's keeping the colorful confetti up at top uh, separated from the GI tract is mucus, and I never thought I'd be so interested in mucus as when I became a gastroenterologist, but uh, I, thought, I thought I was going to avoid that. Um, that, that body fluid, but I don't. And um, the colors at the top are all the resident bacteria and microbiome that live in our GI tract. And then far below, you can see the immune system cells. And they're just sort of waiting there, ready to respond to something going on. Um, the green ones, they help to kind of decrease inflammation when it's not supposed to be there. So what we see here overall on the healthy side, microbiome, separated from the immune system, everything is kind of cool colors, looks very nice and healthy. Um, and then on the right-hand side, 
you know, they, they have highlighted the bad bacteria being in red, and you can see the cells are further spaced apart, the yellow mucus bar is decreased, so all the bacteria are fewer in number in terms of their diversity, and the red ones are taking over and invading, and because they're getting through, the immune system is really interacting with whatever's going on in the GI tract. There's a lot, there's a bridge between the two, um, so we think that leads to the immune system getting very active. Um, and there's fewer of those green immune cells that sort of keep things quiet. So how does diet play a role in this? Um, so dietary components that can play a role. There are lots, um, and I, I wanna say as a caveat, this is such a, again, a personal journey that I can't say I'm making a blanket recommendation for anyone specifically. This is more to understand the, the concepts of why these work and certainly to kind of keep that open line of communication with your gastroenterologist. Um, so in terms of the, well, I guess let's start with from the top down. So in terms of the biodiversity or the, the, the differences in numbers and the types of the microbiome, we think diet plays a role in which ones of those live in our GI tract. So what we eat feeds certain populations of, of microbes, and so those ones might be more predisposed to grow. The mucus layer, um, if we feed our body fiber, those bacteria like to eat them, and um, they don't want to eat anything else. But if we don't feed our body fiber, they want to eat our mucus layer, which has sugar in it, and so then it kind of depletes the mucus layer. Um, certain things might make the spaces between those cells bigger, and actually we think vitamin D, just as a shout out to a supplement, that might actually help some of the green immune cells do their job a little bit better. So you can see there are dietary components that might affect um, the inflammation of the GI tract. So how do we know these things, or how would we study these things? It's really hard. So people, um, people's diets are really complex, and so to isolate a dietary change that someone is making and make a, uh, an assumption about what it's doing to their infl inflammation is really difficult. So one way we can look at that is by looking backwards and saying for people who have or don't have inflammatory bowel diseases, you know, what does their diet consist of? And we know um, we can look back and say people who were breastfed uh, are less likely to develop IBD. This might be due to the microbiome that develops in that case. Um, diets rich in fruits and vegetables are associated with lower incidence of especially Crohn's and then what kind of fats you're eating. So omega-3 like in salmon versus omega-6 like in McDonald's, saturated fats, <laughs> um, which also just doesn't make you feel very good, I think. <laughs> um, and then, so again, these are association studies. I can't say if you follow all these rules, then you won't have inflammation, but you know, on average, maybe looking back, these are some conclusions that have, or some observations that have been noticed. And then in mice, you can actually, you know, the poor mice, but you can study um, whether inflammation develops by altering just one part of their diet. So the, I think we, we draw a lot of our thoughts about dietary interventions based on the mice. Um, so what you can do is you can genetically predispose a mouse to get Crohn's. You can change something in their, in their genetics um, or ulcerative colitis. So you can, you can have this little mouse that doesn't have inflammation but is unfortunately predisposed to it, and then you can feed it a diet of chow, and um, you can add one thing to one, dot, you can add something like an emulsifier specifically to one, but not to the other, and that's the only thing that changes, and then you can see what happens in terms of developing inflammation. And so we know for mice who had certain emulsifiers added to their diet, like carboxymethylcellulose, or polysorbate 80, these are examples of emulsifiers that help foods be shelf stable, they go on to develop IBD at higher incidences, um, or inflammation preservatives, um, thickening agents, uh, those like carrageenans um, can also increase the risk. So, and then fiber is protective, we think. So again, this sort of like puts into context the why this is all happening. Um, and now we have to bring it to humans um, and try to sort through what works and what doesn't. Um, this is from Margaret Mead. It's easier to change a man's religion than to change his diet. <laughs> Um, probably not easy to do either. Um, and I guess I want to say, too, uh, in terms of dietary strategies, I know this talk was labeled as, um, you know, understanding nutritional needs. There are other applications for diet, and I'll, talk about, I'll kind of um, 
just go through those briefly, but diet obviously can be used in lots of ways. And again, we're kind of focusing on just some of the strategies that might be helpful um, in terms of treatment for, you know, as far as we know. Um, but certainly using nutritional supplementation can help with things like malnutrition that comes with active disease, the GI tract uh, may not absorb nutrients as well if it's inflamed. You might not feel well and not want to eat when it's when you're having active inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so certainly that can help bridge the malnutrition and give the the body the fuel that it needs to to heal and to um, build back healthy GI tracts. Um, we think that there are fewer post-surgical complications in patients who had some sort of supplemental nutrition in the perioperative period. So again, this is such a, a wide-ranging topic, and I'm, I'm definitely happy to entertain questions after, um, but I know it's, it's just personal to everyone, and, and hopefully that you can take away something from this. Um, so just some specifics, and I will say most of these uh, the data that have some backing are in pediatric age, and I think there's just been an emphasis on using diet and IBD in pediatrics, again, from what I talked about earlier. So enteral nutrition um, is something like Ensure. Uh, it's a formula that's been made that if all you were to take in was that formula, it would give you all of your dietary needs, macronutrients, micronutrients, caloric needs to survive. Um, and so exclusive enteral nutrition means that you're taking 100% of your calorie, of your nutritional needs by something like a formula. It doesn't have to be given through a tube. That's something that um, insurance companies think that it does, but they, it doesn't. You can drink it. Um, and some of them taste okay. Uh, they, are, they come in you know, chocolate, vanilla. They're, they can come in full protein, or they can come in really broken down ones that don't taste as good. And in terms of using these formulas, there's really no difference between using the really broken down ones that are stinky versus like the ones that at least taste okay. Um, and so exclusive enteral nutrition around the world, it's recommended as first-line therapy in pediatric patients with mild to moderate Crohn's disease. So um, pediatric patients will take this, this is in like some of the European guidelines, um, they'll take this for six to eight weeks and then transition over to a maintenance strategy that is not based on um, only drinking this formula, um, like an immunomodulator or something in addition to keep things under control. But what is known is that if you take exclusive enteral nutrition for six to eight weeks, it will induce remission in similar rates to corticosteroids. Um, and so with all the side effects of steroids, you know, this is something that's emphasized a lot more outside of the U.S. Um, and then for, there's a very, very small study that compared it to infliximab that showed that maybe it works similarly. Again, not saying if you, if this is all case specific and this is, I think the, the limitation in diet and IBD is that these studies are small. Um, and I think the other big limitation is it's really hard to get kids and especially adults actually, um, much harder in adults to get them to drink one of these formulas for six to eight weeks without any other food, which is understandable. They don't, they don't taste great, they're monotonous, um, and they're expensive when your insurance company doesn't cover them. Um, so the, the evidence really is not there in adults, but it's emerging. Um, so there have been some pooled analyses where if you look at corticosteroids versus enteral nutrition in adults, exclusive enteral nutrition, there um, is favorability towards steroids. But if you then look backwards and say, well, I only want to look at the adults who actually stayed on the enteral nutrition, then there seems to be some similarities in terms of its ability to put the, the GI tract into remission. Um, partial enteral nutrition means that you're taking some proportion of your diet from um, supplemental nutrition and um, the rest is quote normal food, um, unquote. And so actually in Japan there are a lot of studies and then in China some coming out that show that partial enteral nutrition, and, and in any case, partial enteral nutrition is not a sole strategy by itself to treat or maintain inflammatory bowel disease. It doesn't work, unfortunately. It might make you feel better, but again, we talked about all along the way this morning, our goal is for there to be improvement in your inflammation, improvement um, in the lab markers, and also endoscopic healing. So what we do know based on these studies in Japan is that at a year from starting therapy, that there is decreased incidence of relapse and um, 
uh, being on some proportion with enteral nutrition and that using infliximab as monotherapy versus with at least 600 calories a day of partial enteral nutrition seems to, to keep people from relapsing or keep them in remission at a year. Um, why this happens, again, not fully understood. It's possible that this is um, changing the microbiome. That's a big one, we think, is changing which microbes are living there. Um, we think uh, that the decreased exposure to a complexity of foods might be favorable. So when you're using half of your diet as something very predictable with the other half being less predictable, maybe that changes um, the environment and um, it, that there's some decrease in inflammation that can be measured again in like animal studies that, that look at those specific inflammatory markers. But, um, and then, so I'm just gonna highlight one of the exclusion diets. So the, using exclusive enteral nutrition is difficult. It's probably a reason that adults have a really hard, kids have a really hard time, but their parents are in charge of what they put into their mouth a lot of times. Um, and so in adults, when no one is telling us what to put in our mouths, we, we tend not to drink our calories for 100%. So oops. Um, so the Crohn's disease exclusion diet is um, coming, it's out of a group in Israel. And they're studying, they're taking this idea of partial enteral nutrition, where half of the calories come from um, nutritional formula. And the rest of the diet, rather than being a, quote, normal diet full of McDonald's, et cetera, um, is actually based on animal studies uh, an, a specific list of foods that tries to mimic the things we know are going to be going to help inflammation or decrease those things that are not going to help inflammation. Um, so it's, it's preservative free, it's emulsifier free, it's thickening agent free, it's high in the omega-3 fatty acids, it's low in the omega-6 fatty acids, um, it's high in fiber. And so there's a very prescribed list of foods that are allowed during that period. And it has been studied again in small groups of people, but um, and, and a lot of these studies on these exclusion diets, they look at the clinical picture, so obviously super important the way people feel. They look at inflammatory markers, which gets a little bit more into the healing, but very few look at how the bowel is actually healing itself. So endoscopic remission going in and seeing, based on these diets, are things looking better in the GI tract? Um, but in these studies of the Crohn's disease exclusion diet, we know a couple things. Um, in terms of induct using it for inducing remission, again, based on clinical symptoms and inflammatory markers, not on endoscopic healing, um, it does show promise. And um, in this cohort of 47 people that were studied, about 70% went into remission based on those criteria. Um, and that was without other medication. And then for the loss of response study, this is an even smaller group that was looked at, but they were on a biologic, they were losing response or biologic, they went on the, the CDED diet and um, again showed improvement and, um, and maybe were able to salvage their biologic therapy. Um, and then in a pediatric study, this, there was a randomized control study that came out a few years ago that looked at exclusive enteral nutrition versus CDED, and obviously kids appreciated the CDED better. That they, it was more palatable to have some food than to have no food, so I don't think that was too surprising, and it wasn't any worse um, than the EDN. Some other diet approaches, um, the specific carbohydrate diet, again, is very limited, food limited. It was actually de designed in the 1930s for celiac disease, but some people use that. I think there's even less evidence for mucosal healing, but, but does, you know, in anecdotal experience work for some people. Um, the CD treat actually takes those enteral formulas and tries to create food based on what's in those enteral formulas. So like, if there's like some kind of amount of sugar, they might like then take a white bread and, and try to craft together something that, that mimics the enteral formula. Again, very small study. IBD aid, Mediterranean diet, and IgG4, a little bit less evidence for those. Something you think you might have Googled or, or heard about. Um, so future directions. I think the big thing is going to be, one, obviously what we've been emphasizing is these are done sm in small studies and they're hard to stick to. So I think, you know, having bigger groups of people um, and you know, trying to see, see them head ahead. I think the other, the other problem is that we know other therapies work so well that it's hard to get something like that approved to say like, we're gonna use this thing that we don't know if it's gonna work um, compared to this thing that we do. Um, 
And then barriers, I think, are huge. So cost and access, the Crohn's and Coitus Foundation is um, currently advocating for the Medical Nutrition Equity Act. So if you, again, this is a shout out for that bill, if you want to call your federal legislators, um, that is mandating coverage for enteral nutrition for various diseases, but including inflammatory bowel disease. Um, that uh, their government insurance covers it, and, um, and so we're trying to mimic that against all insurers. Um, monotony, obviously, you can't change that other than not doing the enteral, exclusive enteral nutrition. And then physician perception, again, talked a little bit about um, the differences in Europe versus the U.S. Here, about 4% of pediatric gastroenterologists even use or offer exclusive enteral nutrition as opposed to around the world, like 65% of gastroenterolo pediatric gastroenterologists are using it. So I think it's just, um, it's something that because the, the evidence is, is, emerging. Um, I think there is not a confidence in them in the way that some of these other medic medications are being used, but I think our patients really are interested and really want to. Um, so I think right now a lot of people are using them, especially as adjunct therapy um, to medications. This is something if, you know, seems like a relatively low risk um, to try something like that in addition to your medications. Um, and then precision nutrition. This is like again, way, way down the road, but understanding what is your microbial signature, what is your immune signature, what are your genetics, and how can we craft a diet that might help um, help you heal. So I welcome any questions in this very broad topic, and thank you for being here and for, um, for inspiring us to keep learning and keep pushing.